The desire for some kind of third party to run things in the U.S. is pretty common. Complaining about the two major parties in the United States is even more so, and yet actually voting for third parties is extremely rare. How can we explain this contradiction? To find out, join me in this brief explainer on why the U.S. party system has remained a two for most of its history. First, notice that the problem is not the existence of third parties. Most Americans in most federal elections, and even some local elections, have the choice to vote for the Green Party or the Libertarians, and sometimes others, like the Working Families Party, the Constitution Party, the Reform Party, and so on. Second, notice that this is also not because of a lack of ideological choice. Americans have the option to vote for third parties in just about every point of the political spectrum from the very radical on the left or right to the more centrist. And yet, Americans simply do not choose third-party candidates. The last time a candidate was elected as a third-party member was in 1979, when William Carney won a House seat from New York as a member of the Conservative Party. Since then, there have been multiple people that have won as independents, most famously Bernie Sanders, or Democrats and Republicans who have become independent but none that were originally elected as members of any third party. This pattern has actually gotten worse in the past 60 years. Prior to 1961, there were numerous congressmen elected as members of the Labor Party, the Progressive Party, the Prohibitionist Party, the Populist Party, and so on. The reason for this is structural and is based on two main features of the American electoral system. The first is our winner-take-all system also known as first-past-the-post or single-member plurality voting. And the second is the Electoral College. Let's explore each in detail. One of the main insights from political science is that electoral systems shape how many dominant parties develop in a given place. So consider how this would work for American elections. In a situation where a given candidate needs only one more vote than everyone else to win, two scenarios may develop. If voters cannot tell candidates apart, voting patterns will tend to spread across many potential contenders, as happens regularly in primaries. If, however, those voting can differentiate among the candidates across political platforms, then over time people will tend to coalesce around two options. Why? Because the rational thing would be to vote for the person most likely to win that is closest to one's preferences. Otherwise, the voter in question might get a worse outcome, that is, someone even further away from that person's preferences might win. And once two or three choices develop, those differences can be stark indeed. You've heard it a million times. A vote for a third party is a vote for either the Democratic or Republican candidate, whoever is furthest from you ideologically. And whether you think that is true or not, as long as most people believe it is true, two main options will tend to develop. But here's the thing, first past the post voting does not mean that the same two options will develop every time. In fact, most other countries that use the same system, like Britain, Canada, Mexico, or India, there tends to be important regional parties that sometimes become the main parties. So why hasn't that happened in the US? Well, it has, once with the Republicans in the 1860s when they displaced the Whigs as the second major party in the country because the latter broke itself apart over the issue of slavery. So a more accurate question would be, why hasn't it happened since then? The short answer is the Electoral College. Consider how the Electoral College works. In order for a candidate to win the presidency, that person must have one more vote than anyone else in enough states because even though we pretend otherwise, our presidential election is actually 50 different elections that happen at the same time. This means that a voter faces not just the usual considerations inherent in a first-past-the-post system, but also must consider how other people in other states will vote, and how valuable their own state would be for a potential winner. In other words, what would be the likelihood that their vote would be decisive not just in their own state, but as part of a 50-state election? This dual constraint makes it basically impossible for any third party to ever be able to win the presidency, because in order for third parties to have a shot, 
enough voters have to believe that all their voters in the sufficient number of states will vote for their favorite candidate so that they can vote for their favorite choice without remorse. Otherwise, you guessed it, they will help someone much further away from them in their ideological preference. It is not a coincidence that the third party candidate that got the closest to winning was Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. And yet, a guy that is usually ranked in the top five presidents of all time could barely manage a third of the votes needed to win the Electoral College. Meanwhile, as politics has become more and more nationalized, the fact that it is basically impossible for third parties to win the presidency makes voters in local politics even less likely to consider third parties. It is also not a coincidence that prior to 1961, members of third parties were able to be elected to Congress at a far higher rate. And it also means that the two parties have control of the electoral machinery at the state and federal level, which means they can make whatever rules suits them. So it is not that Americans are natural Republicans or Democrats. It is that we have electoral rules that make us so. And as long as we keep those rules, we'll continue to be.